Thank you very much, Chris, for your presentation, which has really been an excellent way to shape our discussion today about Australia as an investment destination. I think the macroeconomic perspective is always a terrific place to start, and Chris has also given us some practical applications of how we can work through as domestic market participants with this wave of capital. I think on the ground, we're all feeling the momentum of this capital coming into Australia. For those of us that are working on transactions, we can see that every bidder list is populated with a significant proportion of offshore investors. And then Chris was talking about our fantastic investment conditions. When we see the pricing that struck on real estate investment in Australia and start to, to analyse that. I think broadly we can agree that for almost any real estate sector in Australia that you care to think about, capital markets are ahead of real estate fundamentals. So there's some very optimistic and positive assumptions being made in underwriting for Australian investments. As a really good example is the recent transaction of China Investment Corporation. We're talking about capital coming out of China which transacted on investor property trust at a 20% premium to the most recent book value. So offshore investors are willing to pay quite a significant premium to get a foothold into a real estate portfolio in our country. What we want to share with Property Congress over the course of the next half an hour or so is really how offshore investors are thinking about Australia as an investment destination and what that means for us as domestic market participants. Property Council has convened a terrific panel to talk through this with us today. The four gentlemen to my left are from a really diverse range of backgrounds, and we've been talking a lot about diversity over the last 24 hours at Congress, and the panel today is a terrific example of how diversity can serve us really well. The offshore capital that Chris was talking about in detail isn't a homogenous set of capital. There's lots of individual capital and investors coming into Australia and it's really important that we as domestic participants understand the differentiators between those different types of capital and I think in that way we'll be much better placed to be able to work with the offshore capital coming through. I wanted to give you a quick introduction to the gentlemen and we will get them to give you a bit more detail about each of their individual businesses so that you can get to know the panel a bit better before we kick off into the Q&A. Justin Fung, on my left, is a global citizen. Justin could choose to live and work and invest his dollars anywhere in the world, but he's chosen to spend a significant amount of time, energy and resources in Australia. So we're really looking forward to hearing about why that's the case and why you've chosen Australia. Greg Lapham is the Chief Investment Officer of BlackRock Asia Pacific Real Estate Private Equity. Greg makes investment decisions on behalf of a range of clients across our regions, so he's going to be really well placed to talk about some of the differentiators between different types of capital coming into our market, different investment horizons, different costs of capital, and so on, and also compare and contrast Australia to some of the other countries in our region and different considerations that he needs to think through when he's investing on behalf of his various clients. Bruce Wan heads up research and strategy for Macquarie Capital. He's based in Sydney but works with investors all over the world, some of the very largest investors, on their real estate investments globally. And Chris Richardson, who we just heard from, is based in Canberra and advises domestic, corporate, domestic corporates on their real estate investment here in Australia. <laughs> um, so perhaps if I could just ask each of the panel to give me your one or two minute elevator pitch where we're on the Gold Coast, so the buildings are sometimes quite tall, you, you have quite a long elevator to come down. Just tell us a little bit about your business and your activities in Australia. Okay, oh, this is on. Uh, my name is Justin Fung, I am with Aquis. It's a, uh, I'm the CEO of Aquis Australia, but it is a Hong Kong company that is in the leisure and tourism uh, industry. And uh, we have projects across Australia, predominantly in Queensland. We do own and operate Casino Canberra in the ACT. 
Chris, you're welcome anytime. <laughs> um, but we have, uh, of course, projects that we're looking at here in the Gold Coast, as well as up north at, uh, with the Aquas Great Barrier Reef Resort at York Isna, which is uh, really a, a flagship project of ours that we've had in the pipe work for a few years. And, uh, we're really excited about that. We, we have such an amazing amount of confidence in, in the growth of the tourism sector here in Australia. I was actually quite surprised about the invitation to speak here because I'm not traditionally what you might think of as any kind of uh, expert on you know, the, the general real estate market here in Australia. I don't purport to be, but uh, again, my company's confidence in this particular sector, tourism, and, and the growth of uh, of Asia and what it's going to do for that particular sector obviously has direct and indirect flow on effects to, uh, to the real estate market here. So it, it does make sense once you start putting it together. Thank you, Justin and Greg. I don't do anything as exciting as casinos or gambling, but I was actually born and raised in Bris Vegas. So uh, I've never quite worked <laughs> out why it was called Bris Vegas, but I don't think it was because it was a fun place. It, it's all right, but Brisbane's all right. I like Brisbane. No offense to anyone else who was born in Brisbane, uh, but I go back there, there often, and I come down to the Gold Coast here. I think it's fantastic, the Gold Coast. So mm. you picked a great place to be, but it does always seem to keep popping up lots and lots of buildings. So money, money is uh, attracted to Australia, and we're going to talk about that aspect. I, I work for Black Rock, not Blackstone. So the number of times people have said, yeah, yeah, I know about Blackstone and done this and that. So I've sort of had a bit of a loss of identity over the last two days. So it's Black Rock. We, we are the largest asset manager in the world uh, with sort of almost 5 billion assets under management. Uh, it's, it's mainly in traditional asset management. So it's bonds and equities, and, and we've only more recently expanded into alternatives, and alternatives is where real estate is captured. So we, we are a minnow in real estate, and we are hoping to catch up to some of those much bigger players like Blackstone and like LaSalle. Uh, so globally, we have 25 billion of real estate under management. In Asia Pacific, we have 9 billion. And in Australia, I have about $49 million. So we're, we're looking to expand on that. So I should be, for any people who've got a building for sale, I should be your new best friend over lunch at the barbecue. Hello, my name is Bruce Swan. So uh, I've spent most of time, my time in Brisbane. So if you're not finding a lot of sort of excitement in Bris Vegas, maybe we should just go out sometime and, and have a look around. So um, I... I um, I am a former Canberra economist um, and spent time in sort of Queensland, as, as I mentioned as well. Currently, I represent Macquarie Capital so for the last eight years um, and spent a lot of time with Leone working in the same firm, uh, working in the sort of Macquarie Capital real estate advisory business. It's the largest private capital real estate market uh, business in the world. Uh, we've raised something like $55 billion over, uh, dollars over the last, last 10 years or so. I spend my day talking to foreign investors, so this panel is, is useful. I spend my day talking to foreign investors, um, some of the top sort of sovereign pension funds in, in, in the globe, uh, partly about how to invest in real estate in other parts of the world, but also to invest in real estate into Australia as well. So uh, happy to contribute on that basis today. I, I think I've already had my... 15 minutes in my case. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. Hopefully that's helped the audience understand a little bit more about the panel and we really hope that you're able to interact with us. We want to keep this lively. We would love to hear your questions during the entire course of, of the next 20 minutes or so. So please um, put your hand up if you have any questions. Um, send them through on the, on the text line that hopefully people are familiar with now if the, um, if the numbers aren't up there already. If you're not familiar, this is the last session. So this is your last opportunity. Send those text yes, so. questions through about <laughs> those places that Bruce is going to take me out in Brisbane as well. <laughs> so I'm going to kick off with the questions, but please jump in um, at any time. So the first one to Justin is, why have you chosen Australia? Why are we attractive to you? Yeah, I, I get asked this question a lot. You know, why Australia? Why now? Um, and... The way that, that you know, my family looks at it is that you know, the world is on the cusp of a, of a 
global tourism boom, the likes of which we've never seen before. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, you know, the fact that in the year 2020, it's projected that there's going to be 200 million Chinese outbound tourists. By the year 2030, the Chinese middle class will explode to about 5 billion people. Or not Chinese, sorry, the Asian uh, middle class. Um, and understanding that when people enter the middle class and have disposable income, one of the first things they want to do is they want to travel, vacation, and see the world. And Australia is so uniquely situated to capitalize on this uh, that it, it's, it's, it's so intuitive to actually put this piece together because you, know, you see all the great attributes that this country has and why it's attractive uh, for, for the, this emerging middle class. And you see, okay, you know, it's, 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 in terms of Western countries, it's so close. The time zone difference is irrelevant. Um, you have a safe country, but you know, one of the biggest things is that this is already regarded as an environmental wonderland, this, this country. It is so beautiful with your natural assets, your open space, and don't underestimate the value of these, you know, the clean air and the open spaces as, as the rest of the world gets cluttered and polluted. Um, you know, I can go on for days about these great attributes, but really the, the, the biggest sign is you look at any one of these independent travel sites that run surveys and you know, when they are asking Chinese and Asian tourists, like, you know, where, where do you want to go? What, what's number one on your list? Australia is at or near the top of every one of those lists. So, again, it's, it, it, for us, it, it actually, it was a very simple answer to, to why Australia. It sounds like the fundamentals are there for that to continue over the reasonably long term as well. Greg, do you have any comments you'd like to make, perhaps more from a commercial real estate perspective? Yeah, we, I mean, I sit there and think about where I'm going to place capital across Asia Pacific. So I, I can place it, you know, north in Japan or west in China or south here in Australia or, or in between. So there's a lot of choices and the money we, we get, it's client money and generally has a different mandate. So, you know, it's got a different uh, position on the risk curve. So some of the money we have is what we refer to as opportunistic. So we need quite aggressive returns. And some of the money is, is more core-like. Uh, so as a destination for core capital in, in Asia, it's actually really quite challenging to, to have proper core investments. So for, for core investments, it's really Japan and Australia. And you've seen this massive increase in foreign capital over the last three or four years, um, particularly into Sydney and Melbourne. And it's because people have been moving away from, from bonds. Bonds don't provide a high enough return. And so we've seen a lot of people sort of seeking out core real estate as a proxy for, for yield on a bond. So where Australia is extremely attractive is, and very different to hospitality, where you've got virtually no visibility to who's coming next week uh, for, for core real estate. And in the commercial space, it's about the lease term. So in Australia, you get very long lease terms compared to anywhere else in, in Asia. And just as an example, in, in Japan, the typical lease term is two years. Uh, so 24 months, but the tenant can cancel it with six months notice. So you have a whale of six months. Whereas, you know, in Australia, if you're a core investor, you virtually don't touch a building unless it's got at least a four, four and a half, five year whale. And with the federal government, state governments being massive employers, they tend to offer very long term leases. So it just becomes like a bond. So from a core market perspective, Australia is very attractive. Uh, on the other end of the risk spectrum, opportunity-wise, it's pretty challenging to get those sorts of returns. So it's not, not top of my pops for opportunity money, but it's very, very attractive for, for core and core plus. That's really helpful. Thank you, Greg. Bruce, when people are looking at Australia, where are you finding that they're most interested in terms of specific sectors, asset classes and geographies? 
So um, the, when we sort of talk to these uh, uh, sort of foreign investors, they are certainly got very specific ideas, and it will differ from, from investor to investors. Mm -hmm. By and large, if they're after sort of core markets, uh, uh, sort of typical core sectors like uh, office, retail, industrial are quite attractive to them for a number of reasons. The economy is actually doing quite well. It's, compared to other economies, it's actually still growing. So over the next five years, IMF still expects sort of 2.8% growth. That's still much stronger than a lot of uh, developed economies uh, and, and sort of uh, even stronger than a range of emerging economies where they're actually expecting no growth. But in terms of different sectors, uh, they're, they're drawn here by relative yield. So anywhere where an investor can find relatively higher yield than, than what they're seeing overseas, um, they, they'd be quite, quite drawn to this market. So mm -hmm. your colleagues at James Lang LaSalle are still reporting uh, uh, prime office yields in around the sort of the 6% mark. Uh, regional shopping centre around the fives and industri industrial around the sevens. Um, yes, certainly there's sort of high incentives associated with, say, office. Even sort of making all the adjustment for, for office incentives, the recent sort of blockbuster transaction on lower yields, we're still looking at sort of net effective yields around 4%. If you're taking money around the world, and you can be anywhere around the world, 4% uh, in Australia net effective terms is still better than 2% in, in sort of New York or London. And certainly a lot's been made about sort of um, major, major uh, sort of transaction from China and the like. Uh, to be honest, if you need to spend sort of $2 billion on office, uh, sort of 5, 5.5% in Australia, gross is still looking better than, than sort of uh, a 4, 45 that you would have had to spend in New York to get something similar as well. So office like Sydney and Melbourne are still relatively attractive because of the exposure to improving financial services, cyclical upswing in demand, falling vacancy, higher rents, and higher values as well. So we do like office, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne. Retail, uh, you know, we're suggesting that, that uh, sort of conservative investors, shopping centres are still good for low stable returns. So if you're conservative, very low return characteristics, uh, shopping centres uh, are still working for you. But uh, for, for sort of more upside potential, we're looking at things like what we call neighbourhood shopping centres or bulky goods with a stronger retail spending, supported by stronger population growth, stronger household formation. These things are driving up retail spending, sales, and, and sort of incomes as well. But overall, we, we do quite like industrial logistics as well, um, partly because of that household formation is driving a lot of sort of distribution of household goods, but also things like e-commerce, uh, online retailing is driving very strong structural demand for logistics. It's basically far less efficient to handle your Amazon parcel than for David Jones to handle a larger consignment as well. So we see very strong structural demand. So uh, for these core sectors, um, you know, these are the things we like, but also we do like a lot of alternative sectors where uh, they're already institutionalised in the US, um, but they're only starting to sort of um, pick up steam in Australia, and they do relative, uh, offer relatively high yields as well, and they're attractive to foreign investors on that basis. Mm.